Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Teresa Mora, and I'm the Area Marketing Manager for East Africa at MasterCard. And I am delighted, and it is a great pleasure for me to welcome all of you to our very first MasterCard SME Masterclass series. Now, I'd like to um, acknowledge that we have our panelists, um, and that we also have a very good representation across the country. So thank you very much for joining. Okay, so as the world continues to fight a public health pandemic, as you're all aware, however, COVID-19 has now emerged to an economic crisis, which is significantly impacting small businesses. And when small businesses suffer, everyone suffers in a post-pandemic world, especially supporting uh, this community is the single most important task right now. And at MasterCard, we are committed to empowering small businesses through our resilient network, our insights, our technology, our products, and our services and philanthropic support, including what we just recently pledged, which is the support of 250 million uh, US dollars. And we are so, so um, committed as MasterCard to support and empower small businesses. The purpose of this MasterCard Masterclass series is to impart critical skills that entrepreneurs need to grow and scale their businesses, as well as raising public awareness during these very turbulent times. Now, ladies and gentlemen, today's series will be broken into three sessions consisting of influential experts from various sectors, and they will cover different topics related to business development. Um, after each topic, we will um, have a Q&A session, so please send in your questions, send in your comments, send in your feedback. Um, you can do that on the chat box. You can also connect with us on Twitter, and our Twitter handle is at MasterCard M-E-A, at MasterCard M -E -A. You can also join the webinar conversation with this hashtag, hashtag MasterCard SME Masterclass. Hashtag MasterCard SME Masterclass. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very excited and that we are getting into start the webinar. And with so much pleasure and pride, I would like to open this MasterCard, um, S MasterCard Masterclass SME series by welcoming Kari Chukru. Kari is our Vice President for Products across Sub-Saharan Africa in MasterCard. And Kari will be giving us an overview of the Masterclass series. Thank you, Kari, and welcome. Thank you, Teresa, and thanks for such a great introduction. Uh, and welcome, everyone, to the Masterclass. Uh, the unexpected events brought about as a result of COVID-19 have had a huge impact on SMEs, some positive and unfortunately, some are negative. However, in unpredictable times, there is a great opportunity and responsibility for corporates, such as MasterCard, to support SMEs so that they have the necessary skills to weather any storm. At MasterCard, we are committed to leveraging our network, insights, technology, and partnerships to help inform and enable small businesses to sustain themselves throughout the times of crises. At today, it gives me great joy to see the MasterCard SME Masterclass Series webinar come to life. I'm excited about today's webinar and the experts that we have enlisted for each of the sessions to impart critical skills that entrepreneurs need to grow and scale their businesses. At MasterCard, we believe in the importance of supporting SMEs. This is because small businesses such as yourselves play a critical role in eradicating poverty, contributing to the economy and advancing financial inclusion. SMEs have the potential to make a positive difference in many communities, provided that they're given the right tools to navigate challenging times, sustain themselves in crises, scale and ultimately lead their business to success. The World Bank actually estimates that SMEs are responsible for 77% of jobs in Africa. And once you power an SME, you're powering an entire community. We know you face several challenges. Some of them include access to credit, the high use of cash and its many restrictions, and also just general business management. As we come out of lockdown and ease into the new normal, what changes do SME businesses actually need? And we've thought about this quite critically, particularly considering that their businesses are not only ones that, we, that were impacted by the pandemic. Their consumers are also impacted and it has left us to see a significant shift in consumer behavior. As small SMEs stay afloat and even excel in this time, you need to make the right business decisions to keep yourself informed and empowered. For instance, a lot of your con consumers have moved from making digital payments, or sorry, moved to making digital payments and started shopping online a lot more than they did in the past. To be relevant in today's markets, it's important to have access to the right level of data and analytics and insights to help navigate this uncertain climate. Ensuring that your business is digitized where your services are searchable, transactions are traceable by creditors and payment processes are digital will really go a long way in opening up new opportunities for your business. Now MasterCard has made a lot of commitment in supporting SMEs, especially in light of the pandemic. Our commitment is, is through our resilient network, insight, technology, products and services, and philanthropic activities, which include our recent pledge of over $250 million to support SMEs during this uh, pandemic. By joining forces with different stakeholders like government, consumers, SME associations, we believe that our collective work will make the world a better place and will make your lives even that much easier as you navigate uh, you know, these challenging times. Leveraging our global payment uh, capabilities, local innovations such as our labs uh, for financial inclusion in Nairobi, and partnerships with mobile network operators like fintechs, banks, and government, MasterCard has, over the past two years, introduced a number of solutions which we believe will be transformative in helping you digitize your own value chain and ecosystem and create a really powerful payment ecosystem 
across East Africa. For example, our MasterCard QR. This is an innovative and interoperable, secure, easy digital payment solution which allows customers to pay um, for goods and services by either scanning a QR or entering a merchant code um, on their mobile phone. But here is what makes MasterCard QR quite exciting. As a digital payment solution, it not only adds value to the consumers who can afford to leave their physical wallets at home as long as they have a mobile device uh, due to the ease and convenience of paying um, with Q that, that QR actually gives. The merchant and the retailers who now accept QR payments are now squarely included in the digital payment space in a way that many of them could not afford for many merchants, having a payment um, term the very that limits the payment options to their customers who may use cash. But with QR, the barrier to entry for merchants is very low which makes it very easy for as many merchants to offer this safe and quick convenient payment options to their customers, um, which in a way is actually contributing to the cashless society and cashless economy. It makes it a very, very huge um, win for you, the consumers, uh, and even the government at large. For customers, even our merchants, we have even thought behind, uh, beyond how do we digitize the first um, level of payment interaction and partnered with um, companies like DPO and it was a partnership that we pushed through in May where we were able to enable small businesses go online with their goods and services across multiple markets in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, earlier this year, we announced that we will be connecting 50 million small businesses to the digital economy globally. And this is a critical part of our global goals to financially include 1 billion people in 2021. Oh, 2025, 2021 would be too soon. 2025, ensuring inclusive growth that can change communities for the better. This masterclass is actually very important in educating SMEs on what's possible and what will help you sustain your business. If you're a small business owner, I really hope that these sessions will inspire you to take action and take your business um, to the right level that it needs to be so that you can continue sustainable growth. Thank you so much and I really hope that you have a wonderful session. Over to you, Teresa. All right. Thank you very, very much, Kari. Um, before we get started, I'd like to welcome all of you to join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag at MasterCard FME Masterclass. If you have any questions during the presentation, please share this on the chat box. And we have a Q&A session at the end of each session to answer your question. Now, I am excited with much pleasure to kick off the Masterclass. And please welcome Nancy Mwai. Nancy Mwai is the CEO and Creative Director of New Level. She'll be speaking on the topic business purpose, mission, and vision, setting up structures for success. Nancy, over to you. Hey everyone, how are you? I hope you guys are great. Um, I'm just from a flight. I was, uh, I, was, uh, I was in Mombasa, I was in Diani, but I promise you I came with my brain. I didn't leave it on the beach. Um, and uh, I can't wait for us to do this. This is one of the things that I'm very, very passionate about. Um, business mission, vision, and especially setting up structures for success. This is something I've been doing for my business for the last two years, just, you know, streamlining structures and figuring out how we can make things efficient. And yeah, let's get started. So we're gonna talk about business purpose, mission and vision. And I feel like these things are very important in any business and they're not just important at the beginning. They're also important um, even in the process of, and as you're doing your, you know, every other month, as you're looking at your business, as you move, because they change, it's 
business purpose and mission and vision it's ever changing so don't feel like if the, the way your business started the purpose you had at the beginning should be the same purpose you have right now it should be an ongoing thing you keep changing with the times i can imagine uh the purpose for my business two years ago when i was starting my shop um when i was doing my store the physical store and now during these covid times two different things two different things guys So I'm a digital content creator uh, and I'm also the CEO of Shop New Level. I started creating content 10 years ago um, and this was my in into fashion. I've always loved fashion. And I remember starting with a blog and the blog led me to getting a styling job at uh, Nation Media. And Nation Media led me to even being a better writer. So I started even doing more content, led me into YouTube. And all that, after all those years, six years later, I started my, my shop. And it was all those small things that I did from the very beginning, learning how to make a website, learning how to create content, how to talk to your customers, what do people want, how do they want to buy it, price points and all that. I learned it from the very, very beginning. So then I keep saying my journey was very ratchet then because it was, I was starting out, it just looked like a mess. But when I look back now with where I am, I'm like everything happened for a reason and it had to happen that way so that I can learn. So this is one of my uh, one of the quotes that I really really love, and sometimes the fear won't go away, so you'll have to do it afraid. And this is in respect to pretty much everything I've done, especially starting my business and the decisions I've made. Sometimes I make the decisions and I'm like, I honestly don't know if this is going to work. Maybe I may not have enough data to you know to check and to know if it's something that I should go with. But I always. I just do it. I talk to friends and I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? But I do it. I research. I go, you know, all in. And you still, you're afraid. You're still afraid to do it. It's not like you're like, okay, I've decided to do it. And you just feel like, oh yeah, relax. No, just do it afraid and take baby steps. I always say, if you want to start something, start with baby steps. So what is your why? Um, this is the business purpose. Why are you doing what you're doing? I'll give you an example. When I started my business, uh, my why was to make money and my why was to, um, yeah, make money. And I remember then, yes, I made money. It wasn't a lot. I used to sell secondhand clothes from Gikomba and I would buy them on Monday, go early in the morning at six o'clock and then take uh, pictures in the afternoon and then sell them on Friday. It was called Market Day Friday and everything was a thousand bob and below. And as much as I just wanted to make money and pay my rent and have something to eat, the cycle was really bad. I'd make money on Friday, spend it on Saturday and Sunday, and then I have nothing. The, I, the business did not have a purpose. It was just there to for me to get money to eat. And I did that for two years. The business never grew. We, I never really went anywhere. I started it with my best friend then, and um, there was no purpose. We hadn't even aligned ourselves. We didn't know what we wanted to do, what the future was for. So when you're starting your business, figure out your why. Why are you doing what you're doing? And um, the, the earlier you do this, the better. So you'll have a trajectory of where you're going. So here I've given you guys an example. My company's purpose is to make women look expensive on a budget. And that has even become my tagline, even on my website. I want women to look expensive on a budget. And that's what I've communicated it to, to my employees. And that's what I've communicated it to people online. your business mission. So this is an easy three step process. You need to state what your business does. So in my example, cause I sell women's clothing, I sell women's clothing, very simple. You need to state how your business does it. Manufacture high quality ready to wear pieces. Then you also need to state why your business does it. That is to make women look expensive on a budget. See, the purpose is still here on the mission. We're still going on that, you know, that vibe. So then you get the mission of the business. Shop new level, we manufacture high quality pieces that make women look expensive. 
without breaking the bank. And that's our mission. So I'm not going to derail myself trying to um, sell a garment that's 20K. I know where my price point lies and I know what my client my clients look for in my business, what they look for when they come to shop from me. So I already know where to stay. So I'm not going to go via off or even sell women's clothing. I said I sell women's clothing. There's a reason why I don't do men's because that's not my mission. Okay, vision. So I remember like a year ago when I was doing my synthonomy class, there was the class about business vision and that class was a it was very, very important. And I remember the one statement that the trainer said. She said, um, your business vision, the vision you have has nothing to do with your current situation. So if you feel like things are not working out right, you're trying to start, you don't have funding, you don't have savings, you have this idea, you have this vision of what you want to build, you shouldn't let your current situation deter you from actually thinking about your vision and your dream. You should actually be able to dream big and just see where you can go. I'll give you an example. Um, just four years ago, okay, yeah, five years ago, I started a, a company. It was called Neon 27. I used to also sell women's clothes, but I closed it eight months later. It was one of my biggest lessons. It was a big failure, but it really, it really pushed me to what I have with New Level. And I remember when I started then, I, I never thought ever that I would uh, sell worldwide. I would be selling my clothes to people in the United States or to in Zambia or in South Africa, Nigeria. I never remotely thought because I thought they have better fashion, they have access, they have options. So why would they buy from me? But now, now we ship on in a week, we can ship maybe 10, 15 packages going out to, you know, the US, we've done Denmark, but it's never really occurred to me. And I remember writing it down and saying, I want to ship, I don't want to ship worldwide, but in my head, I was like, how, how is it going to happen? I have no idea. So make sure your vision is, is something that you, it's grand, you dream it and write it. Don't be afraid. Don't think of the now. Think of, yo, this can happen. I want to, I want to address Beyonce, you know, write that girl. It, Vision can either be one sentence long or it can even be a page long. You go ahead and, you know, do your thing. So we are done with that first um, section. If you guys have any questions, I wouldn't mind answering like two questions when it comes to business vision, mission, and uh, purpose. Um, Nancy, you can, you can go ahead and then we can take the questions right after your session. Huh? Okay, cool. Thank you. So let's go into setting up structures for success. This is, this is something that is very dear to me um, because uh, my business has changed when I've actually set up order and structure in, in, in workflow uh, when it comes to my company. So this is setting up simple systems in order for your business to, you know, to scale and so that you're efficient. Let me tell you, when someone mentioned to me about structures, and I think I remember reading about systems and structures like four, three years ago, and I thought it was something extremely complicated. I was like, but I'm not big. I'm not, you know, I'm not this huge company. Why am I doing structures and all that? And I'm telling you guys, even though you're one employee, you're just... Your, you yourself, you need structure because when you introduce one person one day, they will need to find structure in that company. They need to know how things run, what is the workflow for them to know this is how we do business. Because if you have no idea, even a simple thing as responding to a WhatsApp message or responding to a DM, if you have no idea how you do it, or you just say, hey, yeah, it's not available. Hey, yeah, no. No, a simple thing as saying, we say, hey, welcome to Shop New Level. Thank you, you're interested in this product. It's currently not available, but we have this in stock. Can currently check this or that. When you do that, when the next person comes, when you hire a social media manager, they'll find that. They'll find that is the flow of what you do and that's what they'll come into. So let's first by talking about forecasts. Um, 
a year ago, uh, August 1st, I remember I quit YouTube. I, I mentioned that I'm a content creator where I used to create videos for YouTube, um, Instagram, I create content on there. A lot of you follow me from there. But I had to quit YouTube because I remember having a, you know, a tub of war of thinking, wow, I love YouTube. And then I have new level here. I remember sitting outside my shop and looking at it and thinking, I don't think I give you enough attention. YouTube is really taking away of my time. And I had to actually choose. It was very hard because I really do enjoy doing videos. And at that point, I was like, I have to choose something. And I've come to believe that you cannot do um, 10 million things and expects to succeed in the 10 million things that you're doing. So in the, that one year of me um, deciding to focus on new level, we went from two employees, me and the sales lady, to right now we have eight employees. We quadrupled in our, in our sales. My business purpose and vision changed because I was really giving my business all my mind. I was giving it time. I wasn't you know derailed by other things. And I can tell you this, guys, a lot of people start different businesses at the same time. You can find in one year, someone has started three things. So they're like, oh, wow, she's selling bags. Looks cool. Let me do that. She's making money. You sell bags. Oh, my God, she's selling wallets. She's doing dresses. Oh, wow, she just started this thing. No, let's not do that. What is your, the same way, what is your purpose? What is your vision? What do you see? Start on that baby steps and you start growing that business. And that is the business that will fund you and build you. When you think about it, most of these billionaires that we see, Jeff Bezos has Amazon. He doesn't have Amazon and or Tesla and or something else, Google. He has Amazon. So you need to, when you get your business, start working on it and focus. Give it, give it your time. Every day, I always say you should at least 30 minutes, think about your business, nothing else. Business only. Have a journal, journal about your business nothing else. If you have more time, great, but at least 30 minutes in a day, think critically about your business, where you want to go, what's going on this week. If it's frustrating, write that down. Okay. Let's wait for the, the presentation. Um, Nancy, what we can do uh, as we wait for your presentation to go up, um, we'll give um, Javi a few minutes to put that up. I would want to maybe just take this chance for us to maybe answer a question. That would be great. Lovely. So Nancy, we have a question from Leah. Mm -hmm. And Leah asks, what is your advice when taking out a loan to keep the business booming given the uncertainties during this pandemic? And what precautions should one or should be taken when considering to do so? So just generally about um, financing credit and at this time when I think we are all quite uncertain with COVID, what precautions should one um, have in mind? Okay, what I'd say is proof of concept. Um, because you're not just taking out a loan to keep yourself afloat. I wouldn't advise that. I wouldn't advise you take money to keep afloat because you don't know how long you need to be afloat. Are you creating a new product, introducing something new into the market? Are you also trying to scale something? E.g., let's say maybe you sold, uh, like, like maybe you decided to, like for me, let me give myself an example. I decided to, oh, let me stock handbags. I don't stock handbags. I started my business stocking handbags, but let's say I stock handbags and I'm like, okay, let me buy maybe 30 pieces of handbag, you know, of different types of handbags. Let me see if I can sell it. And then I look at the sales and how quickly maybe the handbags move. And I'm like, okay, this is great. Then you'd be able to say, let me take out a loan. And then you always do your math. I'll take out a loan and be like, Okay, if I buy this X amount of handbags, I'll be able to make this X amount of money. So you're also maybe introducing a new product or you're either trying to scale something you already have, but don't take it to just stay afloat because what you're doing is literally, you're just expensing, expensing, but you're not making anything. So it's best if you do it when you're creating something, making something or scaling and you know, whatever it is you're doing will give you back the money and you'll be able now to continue staying afloat. Great. All right.
Thank you. I think that's a very good, um, very good advice, especially when it comes to analyzing before you actually take credit. So thank you for answering that, Nancy. Um, and Nancy, before you actually get into your presentation and continue, because I can see the screen is up, I'd like to encourage all of you to keep on sending your questions and, and keep on sending your feedback and your comments. And really thank you very much for joining us across wherever you are from. And we really, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us this afternoon. So Nancy, please go ahead. Um, I can see the screen is up. Okay, so we were on setting up structures for your business. And like I mentioned, structures, and it's nothing complicated. It's just different set of instructions for different departments in your business. So here, every business is set differently and has different needs. In order to know what types of structures are needed, you'll need to evaluate your business and start planning. Like I said, it's not complicated. And these are just the standard operating procedures. So you'll need to set that up. Um, these are called SOPs for your business and they should be communicated to your employees where necessary, where especially where they're involved. So each like different, let me not say department, maybe like workflow um, for, for the way your, you know, your business works. So I'm trying to think of an, you know, like a business, let's say, okay, let me use myself again. I sell clothes right now. Um, we used to sell clothes via WhatsApp and you can enter the store or via DM. But since two months ago, we created a website. So our workflow has changed. It came, it used to be someone texting, hey, is this available? And we're like, hey, it's not available or it's available. Give us your details. Here is your payment, how to pay. They pay, we receive the payment. We're like, okay, great. Give us your location. We take the location. We call a rider. The rider comes, picks up the garment and takes it to them and they get the garment. Great. Now our standard operating procedure has totally changed. You clients purchase on the website or you come in store. It's those two things. And that has made work easier and more efficient for us because we're able to um, process orders very quickly. You know, every, I'm sure most, most of you have shopped on our website, so you know how it is. But our workflow has totally changed. Uh, we no longer do same day deliveries, we do next day deliveries. Meaning any order that has come today will be delivered tomorrow morning from 10 o'clock. When we come into work, we switch on our computer and we look at the orders for the, the ones that came the previous day. We pack them, we print out the invoice with the details of the customer, the name, their phone number and their location. We pack everything, fold it, staple it. So when the rider just comes, he picks up the goods, he knows this one's going to Kileleshwa. Kileleshwa, you have five packages, Lovington, you have this, you know, South B, we have that. So you know, it, it's so much easier now. Before, it wasn't as easy. So can we go to the next um, slide? So why do you need uh, why do you need structures? They're very important because of efficiency, scaling, and also everybody knows their roles. So I have different departments in my uh, company. Um, I have the sales uh, department, I have the production department, and I have the digital side of things when it comes to marketing. So they all work together. I have someone for. Um, like for me, I'm the one who deals with the social media and I have to communicate with the person for sales or the person for sales has to communicate with me and say, okay, we have this blouse, it's not moving, what can we do? Then I'll ask the marketing, what are we going to do? What, what, you know, what content can we do? Everything works well together. However, structures are very important when it comes to this because one day my dream is to you know, maybe step back and actually see my company run itself. If your company can run itself for three months without you being there, you know, kudos. And that's, that's the dream. You know, that's the dream. Okay, invest in technology. Guys, but they, this technology is not something hella expensive or anything like that. But it's things that make your work easier and less, and less um, it's easy for you to scale your business, less expensive. So like I said, like for us, we started selling on the website. That's technology. We use WordPress, we use WooCommerce. And imagine, imagine the beauty, especially for people who have websites here. Okay, I think you can understand what I mean. But for those who don't have, let me explain to you. Imagine being able to process 10 orders in a minute or even 30 orders in five minutes, meaning you have 30 people on the website shopping and checking out. You can't do that manually. It's literally impossible. And WooCommerce, it's not expensive. The other thing to increase um, efficiency is anything to do with inventory management. 
guys, it was so hard for us to do inventory management before. We used to have it on Excel. So every time someone would buy something at the end of the day, we would go minusing it. And it really did not, it wasn't just, it wasn't the best, it wasn't efficient, so much work. But with WooCommerce, same system, our inventory is there. That is where all our inventory management is. So we just key in the inventory we have. And that's why we always encourage people to shop on the site. Because now you can't just come and shop randomly. at Oh, let me send you money. I want this item. We're not going to be able to assist you very well. Because what if we had other people shopping and they sent money? You know, it's really confusing. Accounting as well. We use QuickBooks. Sales management, as I said, WooCommerce. Printers. Printers is technology. Now we print our invoices with the customer details. We don't have to write it manually. Imagine writing 30 orders a day manually. Too much work. Computers and anything to deal with manufacturing. Consistency. So structures also afford you consistency in your company. Let me give you an example of complaints. Um, when someone complains and says, oh, I didn't like this or something wrong with my garment, we have a workflow of what we do when someone complains. You know, we're able to track everything. If someone says, I never received anything, I bought and I haven't gotten my item, we have a workflow. By the time anything leaves the shop, it has to be signed out by the rider. If you're using multiple riders, we will know which rider to reach out to to say, this person never got their garment all that gives you consistency meaning the customers know they know what to expect they buy today they get it tomorrow if it's pre-order they buy today they get it in seven days if they need to complain they know where to complain if it's writing a review they know where to write a review everything becomes consistent and at the end of the day you need to make things very easy for the customer you never want to make anything hard for them to figure out it should just be an easy you know kind of flowing thing for them and also for you you know it makes work easier for you as a business person So consistency is powerful. One year of intense focus and hard work can put you 10 years ahead of the game. And this is not just consistently just working hard aimlessly. This is also setting up the structures we've talked about. If you continue doing those structures consistently, those things can lead you further. You realize in one year, you'll be further than you thought you would be. Personally, where I am right now, I, this was my goal in three years but in the focus i've done in the last year it's actually set me you know quite ahead okay so i really wanted to talk about outsourcing um and this uh is something that is very dear to to me as well because of the work that i do not all the time you have to hire especially if you're just by yourself my god you guys you can actually hire a virtual assistant currently i have ever since i got the website i have um i've outsourced someone who just deals with the dms on instagram and that one is able to convert people to shop on the site so if maybe they're having a problem or maybe you know there's a payment problem any small problem that they have they're able to be converted into like a sale by the person in the dm that person lives in mombasa they don't come to work we just have zoom meetings every maybe twice a month just to catch up and see what's going on what's you know what do we have here what are people talking about what are people asking for or should we stock more of? We're able to actually talk about that. So you can always outsource. It's far much cheaper. You just need to make sure these people, they have internet, you know, buy them credit if they need to call clients, maybe they're having a, a customer, like a, you know, a company line for that. And that has really, really helped. It's actually reduced my stress because I love um, marketing. I'm not very good at answering, you know, DMs. I I can't. So it's good for me that I've outsourced it and it's actually gotten us to be more efficient. And we've, you know, especially on the launch day, I don't know if you guys saw me when I launched my, my website, that time it was really crazy and you needed to have someone there. So imagine it like Safaricom customer care, the way you can call them at midnight and there's always someone there to help you, you know, same thing. So lastly, you need to do what's right for your business. You need to be honest with yourself and you also need to take calculated risks. Um, a lot of times, especially on the internet, we look at what other people are doing. You're seeing how they're being successful in what they're doing. And then you just feel the need to do exactly what it is they're doing. And then you start living their life instead of creating your own path, especially in business. You can see someone really sharing their wins and you're like, that's what I want. And then you start doing what they're doing. Like, oh, she's doing this. Let me do that. Oh, wow. She's doing this. Let me do that. There's nothing wrong with that, especially if you're doing, taking 
what you're seeing, kind of the structures and the processes they're doing and then implementing it into your business. But don't just take someone else's dreams and try and leave that. I personally, um, it's something that I've, I've done before I look at her and I'm like, oh my God, I love what she's doing. That's, that's her business plan. I like that business plan. That's the business plan I want. But my business shows me things and she's like, no girl, this is your business plan. That's not your business plan because probably I can't even afford it. My business cannot afford that plan. Another thing is taking calculations calculated risks. Like I just answered that question about loans. Yes, loans are great. Loans will propel you. They will really propel your business, but you need to know your margins. You need to know your numbers. You need to know that if you take this loan, this is what it will give back to you. If you take this loan, this is, you know, these are the numbers, just have them right. So you don't go in blindly. Don't just look at something. Do those numbers. Sometimes we calculate things in our head. You're like, oh, okay, fine. This is the profit. Oh, this is what, uh-uh. No. Do that stuff on your Excel and see if I sold 10, what will happen? If I sold 100, what will happen? If I sold 1,000, what will happen? You need to have those numbers down. And don't forget the other costs, the shipping, the marketing, the packaging, the photography. It all comes together, but we usually forget it. Write all those things because now you have your loan. All your money could go into supporting the product and you don't even have the product with you. So this is a diagram about scaling um, your business. Start with forecasts. Structures, like I said, they are good because you're able to scale. Um, and let me just mention, scaling for me um, is, I can tell you a year ago, last year, February, I used to, I used to import my stuff. So I'd import like maybe 12 pieces. Um, but in a year, my demand has gone up and I've been able to scale to sell 50. So that's what scaling is. You need to be able to be like, okay, fine, we can move, you know, a thousand pieces in a month or we can process a thousand orders in a month. Before, was it possible? No, structures are great so that you're able to keep taking your business to the next level. So focus, evaluate and plan. And then when you come to evaluating, invest in the technology you need, which will in turn create efficiency for you. It will reduce uh, the, the labor that you need and it will increase you know, efficiency for you. Um, and then planning, get your standard operating procedures and those standard op operating procedures for your company will now bring in consistency. So this is a quote I wrote, I think, back in 2017. Um, your ideas will only work if you're brave enough to see them through. Give yourself time for everything you wish to do, realizing that nothing is impossible if you put your mind into it. Plan and organize well enough to succeed. Strange things will jump out of the shadows. If you stay calm and alert, you will set free move on from pressure and find yourself in the position you always wanted to be in. It doesn't mean that you've done all the planning, done all the calculations that everything will go right. No, but at least you've prepared yourself. And it's a, it's a baby step thing. If, especially anyone right now who hasn't started anything. If you start something, don't expect, expect grandness right now. It's a baby step thing. Every single day, Every single day you do something, you're getting better. Every time you try something, you're getting better. Every time you try and you, know, you do new structures, you're getting better at it. So right now I want to take questions. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you, Nancy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Teresa Mora and I'm your moderator for the webinar. I'm the Area Marketing Manager at MasterCard in East Africa. And I want to say thank you very much for joining. I can see we have many, many people who've joined across the continent. Thank you very much for that. And thank you for sending in your questions. Nancy, that was a very, very, very good presentation. You have shared very insightful lessons, especially on business purpose, having a mission and a vision, and more specifically on setting up structures for success for one's business. And Nancy, you'll appreciate that we have quite a couple of questions that have come in, especially on setting up a structure or at least structure for your business. So um, be before I get into that, because I know you've, you've heavily captured that, Nancy, I have a question from, rather we have a question from Wendy Nekoye. And um, Wendy would like to know um, how best to market 
her business and retain customers. I think Wendy has a, has a beauty shop. Um, yeah, so how best to market the business and to retain customers? I know you touched on having an online presence. So maybe you could just probably expound on how she would actually be able to grow her business and to also retain her customers. Okay, so this is quite broad when it comes to marketing. And um, for me, it's about digital marketing. I don't believe in the traditional media of marketing because I feel like nowadays we are like this every day on our phone. So billboards are passing us, newspapers we're not reading, we're all about tweets. So there are different ways to market and I think uh, Mandy and Sharon might be capturing, uh, talking about this. And when it comes to marketing, especially on digital, there's influencers, there's ads, there's the content you create as well, there's the value add you give your customers. Um, I'll give you an example. A good friend of mine, she sells um, skincare and she did a short video just telling people the benefits of a certain product and she got so many sales because of that you know so are you giving your customers value add or are you just selling product 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 you need to also tell them yo this red lipstick date night you know it's very good when you're going with the girls it doesn't crack your lips it doesn't dry you blah 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 this is how you can dress it up it goes well with this blush goes well with this pencil give your customers value and when you give them value they will turn by from you and you'll be so surprised you'll give them value and they'll come ask you the same questions that you were telling them they're like oh does the lips will it dry my lips you're the one who did that but they'll come ask you because now they've learned something and they'll be compelled to buy from you yeah sure that's very true thank you nancy there's we have another question from hilda nema um, and Hilda Nema is asking, how do you set prices for your products and calculations and profit margins? I think ideally it's the whole process in terms of how to um, have a pricing structure and how to, to be able to get a return on your investment um, from what you're selling. So I'm currently selling a profit margin Excel template on my website. Check it there, www.nansimoy.co.ke. I have a shop for that. And it's, uh, it's a virtual product. You'll buy it right now and you'll just get it on your email. And I've set up for you everything that you put, especially for the expenses of the product, mostly the shipping and the buying and the cost of goods. And pricing, I believe it should be nothing less than 40% because at that point you're doing charity work. So girl, uh -uh. and when you now calculate, when you put in the pricing, you put in, let's say, let's just say it's a lipstick that I bought from the United States and I need to sell it. So I need to write the lipstick uh, cost, how much I bought it at, and the shipping maybe to my agent, and then the shipping from the agent to me. And even my shipping from the agent, if they took a bike or a rider to my shop or to my house, I need to add all that because it actually, it actually adds up. So if you bought your lipstick for 10 shillings, you might find landing cost, your lipstick is 20 bob. And you'll find that maybe you are deciding to sell your lipstick for 23 shillings, meaning you're earning three bob a lipstick, but you don't know your margins. You may find your margins are 20%, which at that point you're not running a business. Is. So what you need to do is get the template. It has everything. So make sure your margins don't go below 40%. And from there, at least you can tell, um, you know, if you have good margins, about 40%, girl, you're doing great. Especially if you don't have overheads for rent, that is actually perfect. And then you're able to now price your product correctly. Also, you can check market. What, what, what are people selling? Are there people selling the same product you're selling? How much are they selling? You know, is the quality good? Is it the same thing or not the same things? Because customers see these things, especially if you're a reseller and you're selling some of the same things everybody is selling, customers are also able to kind of gauge. I hope that has helped. No, that has really helped, Nancy. So on the same on the same question, just just to to weigh onto that now, there's a question that has come in asking. Then, how do you pay yourself from your profits? So, how do you define that this is what I need to give myself from the business? Okay, that. Um, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. That has been a struggle. It's it's uh, such a struggle. Um, but at the beginning, let's just say for me when I started as an online business. Um, my expenses, what I used to do is I know, okay, these are kind of the expenses I need. So let's say I know I need to pay maybe my rent for the house, 
uh, I need to, you know, buy my groceries. So what I do at the beginning, if you're living without a, maybe you are working and maybe you're still working. So you have like a side hustle, you've started, you know, continue working. And as soon as you, you're doing your business, you'll be able to see, okay, fine. I can be able to pay myself 20 K because let me tell you something, guys, pay yourself something, even though it's 5,000 shillings start somewhere because the worst thing is you find yourself doing most of the work and the money is going to cost of goods, the money is going to ride us, you're paying your virtual assistant, you're paying electricity and you're left with nothing. But you're the hardest working person in that company. Guys, start by paying yourself something. If you feel like at this point, I can afford to pay myself 10K for my efforts, start there. And the minute you start, doing it, you'll be able to do it. You know, it will be a trajectory of, okay, our sales have increased. We're doing great. Our profits are amazing. Let me add X amount. Because when you don't pay yourself, who is that person who's working so hard? If you are to be minus, what will happen if you're no longer a part of that company? You need to be catered for as well. Because imagine yeah. the day you hire yeah. a CEO, what happens? Yeah. Then that's, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy, for that. So I have one final question. I think, Nancy, there are quite a couple of questions that have come in, but I would like for you to just answer this, uh, this quickly. How do you manage to source for goods from outside the country? Um, this is a question from Wanini, and Wanini says she found that quite expensive. So she's asking, what would you recommend as an alternative? Um... Okay, well, now we're living in COVID times and traveling is hard, but I would suggest the best thing you can do for yourself is save up and just and go in to that country to source. If you, if you feel like you're not very confident um, with that, you can also try sourcing online. But one thing I've learned over the years, online middlemen, middlemen, they, they take your margins. If you can get it from the source, from the factory, it's always better. So if you can find, the best thing you can do is look for factories online. Because what we mostly find is middlemen. Find the people producing the product that you need. And if possible, a lot of sometimes banks, um, the, bank, the bank you're banking with, have these opportunities where they're able to take you to these uh, places in Asia, places in Turkey, to go source for staff. So check with your bank as well because they always have those trips so that you can, um, it's best you go because when you go, yes, you'll use that flight and uh, those ticket prices and where you're going to stay. But let me tell you, it will save you so much money in the long run. So much money because now you'll get goods at now the actual cost by cutting off the middleman. Oh, all right. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was Nancy Mwai, the CEO and founder of New Level. Thank you. She actually took us through business purpose, mission, and vision, setting up structures for success, and she's taken up your questions. And, and thank you so much for the comments and the feedback that you've shared through her session. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for joining wherever you are. Um, please, please feel free to send in your questions on the chat box. Uh, feel free to send your comments, your, your feedback, and you can also connect with us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at MasterCard M-E-A, and you can join the webinar conversation on MasterCard S-M-E Masterclass. Now, um, please continue sending your questions. We'll definitely try our level best to answer as many as we can. We appreciate the, the fact that we're joining from across the continent. Thank you very much and saying hi on the chat box. Now, um, without much ado, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, welcome for our next session, which will be hosted by Mandy Saro. Mandy Saro is the author and founder of Miss Mandy Throwdown. Her topic for this session will be how digital transformation are helping small businesses navigate through COVID-19. So Mandy, the floor is yours and I'll let you throw it down for us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Teresa, uh, for having me here. And I'm so excited that there's a ton of you in here as well. Now, we all know COVID has happened and as a result, there has been, you know, all manners of things that we've had to adjust to, especially with the fact that COVID has been here. And a lot of businesses have had to, oh, a lot of businesses have had to do a lot of changing. Please give me a moment as I try to turn on my camera. Okay, Mandy.
So I think um, uh, Mandy, uh, she's trying to get her camera on, which is, which, is, which is actually good. So we're able to see Mandy as she takes us through her, um, through her presentation. I would like to welcome all of you to keep sending your questions um, and also join us on Twitter. Our handle is MasterCard MEA. Our handle is at MasterCard MEA. And please feel free to join the, the webinar conversation and hashtag MasterCard SME Masterclass. Uh, Mandy, are we on yet? Um, no, okay. not yet. Not Another yet. One. Okay. All right. No problem. All right. So I think. Um, All right, well, we're waiting for, well, we're waiting for Mandy to get her camera on. I think it would be also good for me to just, uh, to also pay, probably if, uh, if I'm able to invite you guys to continue asking your questions, um, send in your questions uh, on the chat box, please. And then we will definitely answer this during Mandy's question and answer session. And this is generally, of course, on the topic that she'll cover, which is um, how, um, how digital transformation is helping small businesses navigate through COVID-19. Sorry, so I think Mandy, um, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen. Mandy, you will just proceed without the camera. I think, um, I think once, as you go ahead with your presentation, if your camera gets to come up, then that's fine. Then it would be very good to see you on the screen. But besides that, Mandy, please do go ahead and, 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 and take us through your, your presentation. Okay, thank you um, for that. So sorry, sorry, <laughs> just go ahead, Mandy, thank you. Okay. So there's been a ton of digital transformations that have happened that have completely um, helped a lot of small businesses. And uh, those couple of things include the fact that there's been a lot of leveraging of relationships, a lot of uh, social media trends. Can I please have the next slide, please? Thank you. The other one right after. Okay, so in response to COVID-19, small businesses have been pushed to move their engagement to social media. They've gone ahead to create a new st uh, product and leverage on strategic relationships in order to stay afloat. Now we're gonna walk through those three things and how they've been uh, really transformative for a lot of brands. And our first point, like I mentioned, can I please have the next slide? Is the rise of cloud kitchens, right? So cloud kitchens during this time have uh, completely exploded and have enabled a lot of restaurants, home cooks, and just chefs overall to be able to offer their food directly to customers through the use of WhatsApp, uh, websites, or even mobile numbers. Because there's a lot more people at home and cooking uh, has made a lot of people curious, a lot of people have been able to start a kitchen that they could be able to run and be able to make revenue out of it. They don't necessarily need to have a operational restaurant to be able to run it. And this is definitely gonna be the future of restaurants. And it has allowed more foodies to be able to eat a variety of dishes. It is being estimated by 2026, it's going to be a 236 trillion dollar industry. So this is going to be very key um, for a lot of uh, small businesses that are all about food to look into getting into the cloud kitchen market. And some of the cloud kitchens that we've seen pop up during this uh, pandemic time include Quarantine Kitchen. We've also had Mo Wings, which has been very popular on Twitter. And also Buibo. Buibo dishes 
absolutely blew up during this whole entire COVID period. And majorly their kitchen is already a cloud kitchen. So imagine how the pandemic has been able to help them scale um, during these times. Also Steph the chef, a great chef, um, and she just decided to use her skill to be able to start her cloud kitchen and that helps keeps your overhead costs really low. Now, outside of that, online delivery services have completely have had to transform and it's all about building and gaining new audiences. How do you use the internet to be able to gain a new audience that you can convert and have them as a recurring customers. We have seen um, a lot of green grocers and online butchers uh, have gone ahead to offer new products. We, for the longest time before COVID, it was unable for you to get a meat package offer on the internet. And now they're in plenty. And it's all because of what's been happening with COVID and having the ease of access of the information onto your phone, you're easily able to order. Now, a lot of restaurants and foodpreneurs like myself have also diversified to curating DIY meal kits to enable beginner cooks and foodies to make their favorite meals. If you really think about it, um, you had to adopt new ideas in order to be able to get to the next level. The new ideas will include the fact that a lot of people who um, organically go to their favorite restaurant are already missing out on their favorite meals. So as a result, there's been a lot of online delivery services that are being catered to this uh, consumer who is already addicted to that product. For example, pot and apron, you can easily get all of the fresh ingredients at home and be able to make a restaurant quality meal within minutes. Outside of that, we have an online butcher like Zulu Meats that has predominantly become the online butcher that people go to when it comes on Twitter. So as a business, you can choose a certain platform that you can predominantly dominate with the product, a new product that you're introducing and as a result, it will help you leverage your business onto making more revenue. And like I mentioned, social media is going to be a huge pillar to businesses if they're going to look to scale. And there's a lot of consumer change that is happening with the fact that we have much more people spending their data on and, you know, looking up new recipes, looking up new products to buy from you. And some apps, some SMEs have adapted by cultivating strategic relationships on social media. And these uh, strategies include sending PR products to a ton of influencers. And it just doesn't have to be um, influencers who have lots of numbers. It could just simply be influencers who are micro influencers because you understand sending a PR project has a huge domino effect. If your product is branded the right kind of way, by the time an influencer is uh, posting you on social media, that branding is going to be important for their audience to be able to start buying into your product. A lot of SMEs are sending out products to influencers, but they don't look into branding. And branding is what will make you stand out, if not anything else. And also creating a content base based on trends and challenges. Um, there is a shawarma shop in... Uh, Hallingham. It's a very small shawarma shop. However, they have completely dominated how they create content on TikTok, especially in order to be able to leverage to bring in the Generation Z that are consistently, you know, doing TikTok challenges. And they're also taking their content a notch higher by taking it to Instagram Reels. So if you are going to create a product, you're going to need to use social media consistently in order to be able to um, combine social media, micro influencers to be able to reach the perfect kind of campaign. And when we speak about influencer marketing, a lot of people think it's always just macro influencers. Somebody with 3000 followers can be able to convert and bring you in a hundred new customers because they've built an audience and that audience trusts them. So a lot of SMEs, because you, they can't afford to partner with macro influencers, they feel like they're out of reach. They never go ahead and partner with any other influencers, right? And micro influencers will give your brand visibility, awareness, and a little bit of reach as well. And SMEs need to start leveraging on the relationships they've had with 
their influencer. For example, if you've, cre if you've sent over products to an influencer and you see that they have great traction from their audience, you should use that moment to leverage on a collaboration and co-create a product or even better, create a digital marketing strategy together that will be a win-win for the both of you. And by positioning products with the right influencer, by the way, that's something a lot of SMEs I feel like get wrong. However, during these times, I'm seeing them get it right. Um, positioning products with the right influencers will get you the right amount of traction that you need towards your business. As opposed to just sending your product to any and everyone, the influencer you choose needs to be specific to you. Even if it's a micro influencer with 3000 followers, do they speak food? Do they speak tech more? Do they speak fashion more? SME sh it should leverage on the micro influencer that is speaking to their audience. Now, how do you go about co-creating products with influencers in order for it to have a ripple effect, right? Um, so the SME and the influencer will get together and create the product. How does this help the influencer? Mostly an SME needs to come in and share to the influencer. You will get a commission per transaction. Also, influencer can be able to create organic continuous content for the product, which is free marketing if you really look at it. Because at the end of the day, the influencer is very focused on pushing this product because they'll be able to get themselves a commission. That's how they get paid. And as a result, they're gonna be committed to creating amazing uh, content for an SME. And SMEs need to realize that they can't uh, micromanage that content. They just need to make sure that they've created a plan together well. Also, an, in an influencer will be able to introduce the brand to a trusted audience. Because a lot of influencers are growing, as a result, their audience is growing their trust in them. And that is the easiest catch to be able to drive new customers into your business if you pick an influencer who has a trusted audience. Now, how does this part kind of partnership help an SME? Well, an SME will grow grow not only by audience, but also new conversions. We all know money. It's, it's, it's all in the coins. It's all in the numbers. And an SME doing this co-creation kind of product will really help them scale um, in terms of numbers, in terms of audience, and also traffic to whichever page that they're selling these products in. Could it be a website? Could it be your Instagram page? However, most SMEs need to start focusing on building a website because you want to have a core base where you drive your audience to have traffic. This is also going to have better ROI on marketing campaigns. You'll be able to, to use the data to analyze and be like, um, when I partnered with Sharon Mundia, for example, we were able to penetrate to X amount of people. We were able to convert about 26% women. And these are, you know, constantly they're coming back to the business. So you're going to need to have a central point as an SME where you can be able to collect data and use this data to be able to win much more. And of course, you're gonna be able to increase your revenue. So I'm gonna give an example of myself um, as Miss Mandy. I do own uh, Miss Mandy Throwdown, which ha has completely gone corporate. And uh, one of the products we wanted to work on this year was to co-create a product with a brand. And that brand happened to be Zucchini. In the whole COVID period of time, we've been able to uh, create this product that has been transformative to a lot of people. And as a result, we've been able to make um, together 1.3 million um, in revenue based on co-creating a product. So if an SME is going to look to scale to really high numbers, co-creating a product helps you bring in the revenue that you are possibly not making um, or you are not making enough of, um, especially if you're just doing it by yourself. So co-creation of products is something a lot of SMEs need to look into doing. Even if you're really small, there could be some influencer out there that you could get into an agreement with. And especially with the fact that you're doing it through commission and a base fee, you'll be able to change um, the landscape of and the trajectory of where your business is going. And uh, that comes to the end of our presentation because pretty much when I uh, MMTD co-created co with Zucchini, we were able to leverage on everything from content creation to the ads, to the products that went inside the box. So 
Uh, I'm open to all of the questions that are going to come from this presentation. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy, so much. You literally threw it down for all of us. And thank you so much for, um, for taking us through your presentation. That was quite insightful. Um, Mandy, there are a few questions that came that you also covered, especially guys were asking if there are any um, cloud kitchens in Nairobi. You also took us through that. You've talked about um, influencer marketing. You've talked about positioning yourself in that social media space. You've talked about the platforms. So I think we've pretty much covered a lot of questions that did come through um, during your session. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are taking questions for Mandy. If you haven't already sent in your questions, please do through the Q&A, um, actually through the chat box. Um, and also one thing I'd just like to mention that there will be a link with the recording of this webinar after and this will provide later. But for now, please do share in and continue connecting with us on Twitter. Um, our Twitter handle is Mastercard at Mastercard MEA and you can join the webinar conversation on Mastercard SME Masterclass. Now, Mandy, I have quite a couple of questions for you. Um, the lovely thing is that at least with your presentation, you were able to capture quite a couple of questions. But still, that doesn't get you off the hook, Mandy. So I have a question from <laughs> I have a question from Caroline Dungo. Yes. And Caroline is asking, I'm planning to start an event management company. What would be the key factors to consider? Some major key factors would be what kind of events do you want to have? Because I feel like sometimes we have a vague idea of what we want to do. However, we need to start being specific. Are the events going to be for birthdays? Um, are they going to be, uh, you know, weddings and all that kind of things? So once you're very specific with the direction you want to take the events company, then that way you can be able to design think. A lot of people don't design think their thoughts, right? So take a piece of paper write out all the things that you're thinking try and, and create a, a form of a structure because once you visually see it on a piece of paper you'll be able to know which direction you want to take the company okay thank you so much for that so um mandy i have another question um which is i think on 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 social media sorry let me just let me Put it up and uh, it's from Grusha Amunga and mm -hmm. Grusha is asking so Grusha asks are you experiencing okay so she's talking about experiencing difficulty in getting visibility on social media space so how would she be able to enhance that yes so you can be able to enhance that first of all you need to start a lot of people are focused on enhancing and getting more numbers. However, they're not creating quality content on their page that will hook people to stay. The first thing you need to start focusing on is the kind of content you're creating on your page. Is it adding value? Nancy spoke about this. A lot of people need to start adding value to their audiences. So as a result, you need to focus on creating content and just being consistent with creating all that content. You can't post one post and then you post two weeks from now and you think you're going to get followers. No, you're not. Your business is going to struggle. And as a result, your numbers will never grow and you'll just be at a plateau consistently because you also are not consistent with your dreams. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that, Mandy. I think it's consistency, just having whatever even Nancy even covered that, especially on that, you know, that vision and, 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 you know, having that, having a mission and be able to be consistent with your business. Now, um, so Mandy, there's a question from Christine Buru and Christine yes. is asking, hey, Mandy, what is the best way to send PR packages to influencers? What's the best way, sorry? What's so that? Christine is asking, what is yes. the best way to send PR packages to influencers? So the best way is um, first make sure that they speak what your brand speaks as well. Like you guys are aligned. Second of all, contact them, especially through their email. A lot of um, influencers uh, get sent a lot of DMs from their audiences. So as a result, they could miss your DM. So send an email, ask them if you could send out the product. And by the time you're sending out the product, make sure the packaging looks amazing because you want this micro influencer to be able to Insta story organically, to be able to post a picture organically. So if you are not giving out great looking 
different types of packages, a lot of people will just post the product. However, your product is not an experience anymore. A lot of us are visually inspired to unbox on the internet. So a lot of brands need to start focusing on their packaging so that by the time the micro influencer is getting the product, it's just boom, bam, bam, snap, right? Post rather. And then another thing is um, make sure that there's a thank you card inside there. Um, and don't put expectations. Don't be like, hey, we expect a post from you. Do not put expectations because that, that makes a lot of influencers not want to create content for you. They just want to organically do it. They don't want to be given rules and regulations, yet you're not paying for it. Sure. Uh, Mandy, I think we have a few questions that are just directly linked to influencer marketing. I just, and, I, and I just want to, you to connect in your, re, in your, just, in your just response right now. And yes. um, Jennifer Odera is asking, uh, are affiliate programs attractive to influencers and commonplace here in Kenya? Affiliate programs, are they attractive to influencers and the commonplace in Kenya? They're very attractive to influencers because at the end of the day, an influencer knows that they need to push a product in order to just make money. Because at the end of the day, we understand what this exchange is about is for me to make revenue. And um, an influencer isn't just looking at the revenue from a perspective of, oh my God, I'm getting this money. They're also building a uh, brand building, right? Because their audience is realizing um, this person uses this brand consistently, right? And that authentic story is always going to be important to the influencer and you can be able to reach out to an influencer if you have a website right and if you have it in built already on your back end you can be able to recruit as many influencers as you can and give them affiliate codes it's it's lucrative because a lot of um affiliate marketing starts percentages start from five percent commission uh commission starts from five percent so you can be able to talk it out with the influencer and reach the rate that works for the both of you i hope that answers yep that does actually answer because there are quite a couple of questions others i feel like monday you might have covered but without assuming that there's a question that came out and says um that has come up and says uh, how can you stand out as an upcoming food content creator i know you touched on it maybe just reiterate on some of the key points that you covered during your presentation so let me say the question again how can you stand out as an upcoming food content creator and something that can really make you stand out. So this person has not given their name. It's an anonymous attendee. Mandy? A lot of people have a lot of doubt with personality. I believe everybody has a USP. There is no formula to getting popular online. It's just having your own unique selling point and really, really focusing on that. I'm going to use Miss um, Mandy Throwdown as an example. Consistently using the word Miss Mandy, throw down, throw down, throw down, throw down. Everybody becomes affiliated, understands the word throw down. They think of Mandy, right? So build something and try to really drill it into people as consistent as you can be. And if you're going to put it up on stories, you can be putting little, little like hashtags where nobody can see, nobody can click. You need to start screaming about this brand of yours because you are all you got. That is the only way you'll stand out. Consistency with good, quant good content, good personality. I don't want to say good per se, but just having your own personality and then just being consistent. You, can, you can't just win without consistency, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great reminder. I think, you've, um, Mandy, you've, you've actually touched on it and nailed it even further. Consistency, consistency. I think even when everyone hears the word Mandy, the first thing is throw down. You know, and it's a brand that you, you own and you visibly live through it, you know, even on social media. So I think... Um, that's a very, very, very good example. So Mandy, thank you so much. That was really a wonderful presentation and you've, and you've answered the questions very well. Um, thank you so much also for the insightful lessons that you've shared throughout your presentation on how digital transformation is helping small businesses to navigate through this um, COVID-19 period. And um, now, even before I... I introduce our next and our final panelist. I'd like to invite all of you to keep sending your comments, your questions on the chat box and also connect with us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is MasterCard MEA and you can also join the webinar conversation on MasterCard SME Masterclass. 
Thank you very much, Mandy, for, for that. Now, next, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to um, take this opportunity to invite our final session for the day, and this will be addressed by Sharon Mundia. This is S. Sharon is a content creator and a brand strategist. Sharon will be taking us through social media marketing for small businesses, the tips and the tricks. This is very, very interesting, even um, as you have received even a few questions on social media marketing that have come ahead. Now, Sharon, over to you. Thank you, Teresa. All right, let's get started. Okay, so I'm taking you through social media marketing for small businesses, and I'm going to share all the tips and tricks that I picked up along the way. And where do we start? And for the record, I'm really passionate about this. I've created my career around this. I, I've helped businesses with this as well. Um, but I think a great place to start would be the beginning, okay? So, uh, things were rough back in 2012, but you couldn't tell me nothing. I thought I was the hottest thing in town. And I just had no shame in the game. Um, I mean, I look back now eight years later and I'm like, oh, okay. For the record, my eight-year-old sister was taking most of my photos. I um, was doing my YouTube videos. If you guys can remember the first one I put up in 2013, I had at least four people interrupt me, all of whom were under the age of six. It was a mess. But I think the reason I'm even bringing this up is, um, is because there has to be a beginning and the beginning isn't always pretty. And I think social media can be such a daunting space. If you think about putting your first post on Twitter, on Instagram, you kind of feel like the pressure of it being perfect, but it doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to start. Um, so I also have to say that I haven't been online for eight years um, um, consecutively. I, at some point, took a break, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit towards the end, um, but it was a break because I felt overwhelmed with this platform, which it can be overwhelming too. Um, but ultimately, it's a great place to build a brand, to be able to have connections um, and different touch points with your community, um, and ultimately to sell your product. Um, and also, I've just seen from the comments as well that I saw that there's all kinds of people who are here and have joined us as well, from farmers to people who are selling beauty products. Um, and ultimately, I think social media is something that you can't avoid. All right. So... Why, 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 why? What are the four things that I want to talk, to talk about today? I want to touch on the why. Mandy and Nancy talked about how important that is. I'm going to take you through the different platforms that are available. We will touch on content and then we'll finish up with community, which I think is re really important on this uh, um, when it comes to social media. And towards the end, I'll also give a couple of do's and don'ts, um, some general do's and don'ts that might come in handy. But now, on to the why. Why do we need social media? Let me tell you something. 2020 don't show us, okay? If you walked into 2020 like I did, like y'all don't even know. I'm here to show you, okay? I'm going to shine, prosper. All of that went out the door with the pandemic. And, and Mandy talked about that too. And I think what was interesting to see was that businesses that had neglected social media or at least neglected creating different touch points um, with their customers, they started to wobble a little bit. Now, it might seem that you have, say, a brick and mortar space, a physical space. So how exactly are you supposed to connect with consumers online? It's, you know, you're selling, um, you're selling, I don't know, shoes, you're selling milk. How are you supposed to connect with people online? There's always a space for brands to come in. And in fact, as I was think, as, as I was researching this, I did try and think which brand have I never seen on social media and why would that be? Um, and I think it's only cigarette brands. And I wish I, I wish I could get feedback. If you've seen a cigarette brand advertising, I don't think I have, but I think pretty much every other brand is online. Because like it or not, you cannot ignore the power of social media. And the last six months have shown us the importance of it because you're able to connect, you're able to have a meaningful relationship with your audience. Another reason why, and I don't know if you've seen it, you've, you've seen this kind of meme or this saying, have you seen people saying, sis, take my money, okay? I can't wait to give you my coins. Have you seen that kind of reaction to a person talking about a new product? The reason why 
people would have a visceral reaction to like, yeah, I want to support you. I'm going to do everything in my power to be shouting your brand and shouting your praises is because you've done a great job of telling your story, of being able to not just sell product, but sell your, pro sell your story. People are able to connect to you better. People are able to be loyal. You'll find people arguing in the streets as to why your milk is the best milk in the business, why your lipstick is the best in the business, why Rihanna is the queen that she is. It's because you've built something special there. Another reason why I think social media is important is that you now have a cost-effective way to market your brand and to market your vision or to sell your vision. Um, but also you've got data and that's something a lot of people kind of forget about that if you've got a business account that you're able to go to the back end and understand where are your audience um, coming from, where are they tuning in from, which cities are they from, how old are they, what are their age groups, what times are they online and you're able to use this data to then influence, help you pivot if you need to um, and see where to take your business next and a lot of people don't focus on the numbers um, but I think that's an important reason as to why social media is beneficial because if you did if you took the normal route of a billboard there might be estimates as to how many people have seen the billboard but you don't have you don't know where they live if they're in Nairobi or oh, well I guess if it was in a certain part of the world you probably would but it's harder to kind of get into the nitty-gritties of the demographics which social media gives us access to okay so now the platforms um so for the record these are 10 10 uh, platforms that have just been inverted. But I wish, I wish I could ask you guys right now and if you could tell me if you recognize each and every single platform here, if you'd be able to tell me, I know this, I know this, I know this, this one I don't know. Um, what was really interesting was when I asked my 17 year old sister if she, can, if she could recognize every single one of these, the only one she was like, Ooh, I don't know about that one was LinkedIn. And I was like, it's okay, it's fine. LinkedIn is not exactly, you're, you are not the target audience, but soon you will be. But these are 10 of the biggest uh, platforms, and I'd say here in Kenya, some not so much as others. There is Facebook, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok, which we can talk about, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, Snapchat, and Tumblr. Now, I think I mean, I'm going to talk about some of these, but I think Pinterest and Tumblr and, and maybe, yeah, actually those two, maybe not so much because I don't know how um, popular business they are here for businesses, although they are truly beneficial. But let's start with Facebook. It is by far the biggest one. It's got the most number of users um, than any other. It also was the first one to have, to have started. I think it's now, I'm not sure, 16, 17 years ago. Um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a great place to start. Uh, I would, however, question whether it is the most effective for your business. So you'd have to kind of dig deep and find out if that's where your users are. YouTube is growing exponentially. It's, it's insane. Everyone and their mothers are on YouTube, which I want to bet. I mean, that's where we catch our news. That's where we catch uh, our, tutor our tutorials. It's a great place for you to be if you are an, an, are an expert in a certain field and you want to try and relay those expertise. What's up? You know, you can argue, is this a social media platform or not? I think it is. And I think it is, especially for people who are not in the traditional um, social media setups, because there are people who are resistant to social media. I understand why. So I think WhatsApp is a great place and you'll see it being used. If you think about it, like with artists and musicians, I've had um, kind of messages being sent, check out my new video. I've even got um, a restaurant on WhatsApp. Um, I, don't, I don't think I mind sharing it, but Art Cafe, I think they're the only ones who I would allow because I, I don't mind a salt of caramel. So WhatsApp is, I think, a, a valid place. There's Instagram, which is heavy on visuals and aesthetics. There's TikTok which has come and taken everyone by storm. Um, it's got more users than Twitter, surprisingly. Um, and it's a very visual, it's a, it's a very young space as well. Um, Twitter, this is like a micro blogging space uh, or site. Um, you've only got a limited amount of characters. So it's kind of, it lends itself to kind of witty uh, comments or, or more news related comment, uh, information. Um, and then there's LinkedIn, which is good for B2B. I think I'm going to stop on those, on those, but I think ultimately what you need to do here um, is to make sure that you start small. 
you cannot try and take on all 20, 10, whatever that number is. You can't, you can't try and take, all, uh, take on all 10 and assume that you're going to get it right um, and that you're going to be able to post um, on all different platforms um, and give them the same kind of attention. My advice to you here would be to start with two. Two that you feel strongly about, two that you feel that you've got a grasp on, but more importantly, that you recognize that that's where your audience is. So for example, I might, you know, you could be selling, I don't know, you could be a young farmer. Let's talk about farming because I saw someone say that they're a farmer. You could be a young farmer um, who loves TikTok because, you know, TikTok. But when you're thinking about selling your product and pushing the idea that you've got organic food and you would need to stop and ask yourself, is that where you want to sell it? What is the age bracket that you're trying to, to kind of connect with your target audience? Um, would Facebook be a better space? Are you trying to speak to the parents, the people who are making decisions in the supermarkets or the kids who you're kind of feeling in touch with? And, and so I think it's not just important to think about what you're good at or the platform that you like, but the platform that would have the greatest impact. Um, the same could be said for a bank, a bank. They might be thinking, I want to open um, a TikTok account because, you know, there's so many kids there or young people, and I mean, not say kids, but younger, you know, young, the, there's the younger audience there and they'll soon be opening accounts. So let me go there. But is that ultimately the best place for you to try and um, have a touch point, a serious touch point with your, with your audience? All right. Another thing I want to say, though, uh, uh, you know, with all those um, platforms, a lot of, you know, a lot of your content has been impacted or your ability to reach that audience has been impacted by algorithms. Like it or not, Instagram, Facebook, all these other platforms, they're trying to make money, too. So they've made it such that you can only speak to, you can only reach a certain percentage of your audience. So in order for you to tap into the rest of that audience that you've organically built or you've taken time to build, you've got to pay a certain fee. I think what's interesting about TikTok is that they haven't yet, at least not as far as I know, but they haven't yet been influenced by, or been hit by the algorithms and how it impacts um, your ability to be able to speak to your audience. All right, now let's get into the content. I don't know why I said in French, I'm not really French speaking, but let's get into the content. Okay, there's two kinds of ways that you could possibly sell whatever you're trying to sell. You could go in for the hard sell, where you're like, listen, here is some earrings. They are 500 well, buy them. Here's my Impesa till number, full stop. And you kind of sit back and you're like, my job here is done. And I've seen that, I'm sure you guys have seen that as well. I've seen that with like, second hand clothes, uh, clothes shops where they just kind of put the item out, they put the price and that's it. You buy, you don't buy, doesn't matter. There'll be like 50 other people who want to buy it or not. And that's an approach you could go for if that's what you're into or you could take your time and build a connection with your audience. You could leverage on that human connection. You could make sure that you have a personality. You could refine your voice. I think Rihanna has done such an amazing job at this, at being able to build a community. And it goes back to the example I was giving where you find people who would be ready to fight in the streets because what they've done is they've been able to give you something. So it's not just like, give me your money, give me your money, thank you, bye. They're not just taking, you know? So there's, there's an element of, I want to share with you a tutorial that I think will come in handy. I want you to see yourself in the runway. If you think of Savage X Fenty, which is Rihanna's lingerie brand, we've seen pregnant women on runways, which means even a pregnant woman can, you know, be sexy and deserves to wear good lingerie. I've seen uh, people who are differently abled. I think of someone who either didn't have an arm or, or didn't have a leg. I, I, I don't know. But you've seen all kinds of people. If you think of her beauty brand, you've seen the darkest of dark beauties, like black skinned women being able to find their shades and not find their shades on the third or fourth launch of your product. But right from the start, it was, I see you, I hear you, what do you want? How can I help you? I'm here to serve you. And that's what ultimately leads to a sense of community, to a sense of ownership, where you start to feel like, no, this is, this is our brand. This is, we've, we've done this. 
And, um, and I think that to me is, if you're thinking of long-term strategies, that has to be your approach, not hard sells. All right, I wanna give you guys an example, um, which is gonna be on, on this slide, which is um, around something that I really like. If you follow me on social media, you know that I am a sweet tooth. I love my cakes. I love my salted caramels. Um, and I wanna take you through Cupcake Gemma. So she is a British uh, baker. She's a content creator, but she started off just loving baking. And you'll see it's the first one with the mixer. So she started just loving baking. And she, she, at the time she was still living in her mom's house, but she would bake little cupcakes and then take them over to like a market over the weekend and sell the cupcakes. Um, and then once uh, she grew and she was able to put her finances in order, she was able to start a small little bakery, which is called Crumbs and Doilies, which is, you know, it wasn't that to begin with, I don't think, but it was, you know, a, a step in the right direction. Now, most companies, and I think this is especially true, um, you know, like a, a while back when social media wasn't the, the beast that it was, but most companies would have just continued on this trajectory, which is, yes, open a bakery here, expand to this town, expand to that country, go over to that continent. But I think what she's done is a great testament to what, how impactful social media can be, um, because what she then did is she started a YouTube channel. And those secrets that often bakers or you know, people will keep to themselves, she started to share. This is how I make that beautiful, gooey, gummy, um, uh, what does she make? Brownie, that nice, yummy brownie that you come to my bakery to buy. This is how you can make it at home, okay? Here are the ingredients. Let's make it together. From that, she was able to build a community and she was also trusted as, as an expert, as someone who knows what they're doing. Um, she got to, recently, I think it was about a year ago, she got to a million followers. But because of that, she's not able to sell merchandise. So you see that apron I was wearing, you see that mixer that I was using, you see the spatula, here it is, you can get it too. So we can pretty much do the exact same thing with the exact same tools together. And then, uh, she, once that was done, she then, during the pandemic, which I think is a really important thing to note, is that she was able to sell boxes to her audience um, because you were at home, there were restrictions, you couldn't exactly buy these uh, products in the shops because you, I don't know, it was just harder to get into the shops. So don't worry about it. What I'm going to do, and this is what Cupcake Gemma did, what she did was she put together boxes that, you, that had everything that every last ingredient, whether it was sugar, flour, uh, baking soda. Here, here's a box, you can do it at home. I guess what I'm trying to show you is that she's just created so many touch points in which she can connect with her audience and that just makes it more meaningful. That makes you feel more connected, but it also means she can sell you a million and one things, okay? Okay, so um, the last point when it comes to um, the content is I just wanted to share with you guys a few of the apps that I use. Um, and these apps just make it easier for me to create some a co content that's more cohesive and feels like I, I know what I'm doing, even though that isn't always the case, but it makes it look like, ah, oh, she, when I go to her page, I kind of understand what her theme is. This is what, you know, this is, I, I hear her, I see what she's trying to say. And I think this would come in handy for a lot of brands as well, or businesses, if you're trying to create something cohesive. Unam and Plan are great apps for kind of being able to like, slot your pictures. You'll see some of the pictures also there. I haven't even posted yet, but it's because I'm like, where do they fit in my story? Um, film is great for videos. Unfold is really good for Instagram stories. And Canva is great for everything, everything. Business cards, uh, sale posters. If you don't know where to start, it is like, I don't know, digital, it's everything. It's, it's, helped, it's helped even with this presentation. Okay, so now going into community, and I think this is something that is the most important. I think ultimately this is why you would be on social media as a business, it is to try and enhance those connections. I wanna talk about someone who is a Nigerian uh, content creator. She's called Pisaya Longe, and she started a brand called Kai Collective. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, I really, really would, again, I really wish I could see your hands if you're like, yeah, you're so bad. But it has been really fascinating seeing what she's been able to do with her brand. This dress specifically, I think it is the dress of 
the, the, the summer in the UK and America where they've got summer. Um, but I think it has been the dress, if not one of the dresses. Um, and it's, I mean, if you see what she's even saying here, maybe forget the first line, <laughs> even though it's really witty. Um, what she's trying to say though is, I need your help. I'm struggling to come up with the name of the dress. So what is she saying? She's saying, hey guys, what do we call this? She called it Gaia. She didn't call it uh, uh, Selena. She ended up calling it the Gaia dress. And that meant when you saw a, a star, a celebrity wearing that dress, I, I could see it. I could see it in her post. There was like an overwhelming reaction of, that's our dress. Oh my God, Sweetie is wearing that dress. And it's because she's just been able to build from the get-go. She was like, this is what I'm starting. She started as a content creator. And you see it too. You see it with Nancy. Nancy is a great example. See when she like goes to, I don't know where she was the other day with that great, great view Nancy will tell us. But like when she was walking with the red pants and you're just like, I want that. Like there's a way that you can go about selling and creating a community first. Like taking her, for Nancy, I'm going to go back to Nancy because that's an example here. But the fact that you know and you hear her story and you know how difficult it was that she had to make sacrifices, she had to quit YouTube in order to focus on that, it builds a sense of, I got you. Next time you drop a line, I got you. I'm going to be there. I'll buy, I'll show up, I'll do whatever I can, I'll share. It matters. So create a story, create a sense of community um, and ask questions. That helps gauge helps you gauge upcoming trends. Um, and I think this should ultimately be your goal. Um, and again, how do you build a community? You give yourself time. You give yourself time. You give of yourself as well. You, you share tutorials, you share, um, and I think Joanna has done a really good job of, of this as well, Joanna Kimuvia, so that you're not just saying, bye, lipstick, thank you, bye. But it's, hey, let me show you how to do your eyebrows. Hey, let me show you how to, I don't know, take care of your piercings. And then also I launched a lipstick brand. Do you care to partake? It goes a long way. Okay, so let's talk about um, collaboration. I think that's also part of community and that Mandy has touched on that, on that a little bit, so I won't go into it. But I, for me, it was the idea of also building uh, a community that, that is give and take with another brand. So find creative ways to partner with brands who are kind of speaking to the same people. I've seen, for instance, a skincare brand partner up with a tea brand. And on the, you know, and also it kind of, kind of, it shouldn't make sense, but it actually does because they're kind of both speaking to the idea of self-care. So let's come together. Let's create a, some, something special and present it to the audience and see if they would like. Um, and then of course there's content creators um, and influencers. Mandy talked a lot about PR packages, so I won't touch on that, but you can also just go ahead and ask for rate cards, see if you can have a long-term partnership. Oh, oh my gosh, I hope you're all following along. You're enjoying this, I am. I wanna talk you through the do's and don'ts very quickly. Um, first is be consistent. That's the number one thing you hear every time. And guess what, guess what? It's because you have to be consistent, like it or not. Um, 10,000 hours, just do, do, and do again. Another, another tip I'd give you here is please do separate your business accounts from your personal accounts, okay? Don't be Betty's Bakery tweeting, by the way, Gilbert, you think I didn't see, okay? You over the weekend? No, separate. They've got to be two different ones. Um, and then use insights for strategy, so don't just focus on, um, don't just focus on the, the, no, do focus on the numbers, be accountable and um, jump on challenges. That's always fun. And then for don'ts, it is don't plagiarize, don't take people's work. Please don't ask people to DM for prices. I don't know why we do that here. It's like, don't do that. Don't do that, please. Um, don't duplicate content across channels, so don't put the same thing across all of them. And don't speak at your community. Talk back and forth, let it be a dialogue. Um, and is there anything else? Lose sight of white, yeah, don't lose sight of white. So don't be so focused on the numbers that you forget why it is that you're doing what you do. Um, so numbers are great, but don't lose sight of your why. And I think that wraps it up. I think that's it. Um, 
I, actually, on, on, the, on the last slide, you see me say that I'm asking that you are not asking, but kind of reminding you to remember that it is, it is about creating magic and having fun with that. And I think I just wanted to leave you with this one quote. Um, it's something I saw on this show called Social Dilemma. It's on Netflix. It talks about social media platforms. It's a little bit scary, but I think it's worth watching. And the quote says that there are only two industries um, that refer to their customers as users. Only two. First is the drug industry. And the second is the tech industry, software industry. And I think that says a lot because social media can be a very addictive place. Um, and that can be scary. You can find yourself going up to talk about a sale that you're having for your shoes. And then next thing you know, you're just scrolling for hours. So I think just kind of hone in on your why um, and create magic, create magic. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Sharon. Wow, 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 wow. For the very insightful lessons. And I, I love the way you've given um, local, local businesses as examples throughout your presentation. So it was very easy to actually um, associate even the content that you took us through with some of those examples. You shared mm. very valuable points on social media marketing for small businesses. Um, and I think there are very many questions that have come through, especially on social media marketing. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. We are taking questions for this session now. We're in the Q&A session for Sharon. And if you haven't already sent your questions, please do do so in the Q&A chat or in the chat box. And I'll definitely be able to send or actually ask Sharon the question. Now Sharon, I would like to start off with a question from a gentleman called Edward Kusewa. So Edward asks, lack of internet access um, affordability hinders SMEs using their digital footprint effectively. What alternatives are available? So this is slightly off social media. So lack of internet uh, is, is quite a hindrance for SMEs. So what other alternatives are available? Besides the internet, when it comes to social media, I'm not trying to I understand that. Although, I mean, I, I, look, I, I think if you're asking, say, it's expensive to have wipe internet um, installed in your home, I think what's great now is that there's a number of places that are public spaces that do have free internet. Um, or, listen, at this point, ask for help. Ask if you can go over to a friend's house. I can't tell you how many times I've asked, or at least when I started, I would ask, can I please borrow your camera? Can I please use, you know, use, I, I mean, I even borrow my mom's shoes. I think one of the first pictures I showed you, I was wearing my mom's handbag. There's no shame in the game. I think if you need to ask for help, if you need to ask for a quick hotspot so that you can, you can upload a picture, I think that's worth it. Although I do, I, again, I do say that I, I do think that there's a number of people who have um, been able to, to, to give, to get free internet, a, a number of establishments. But outside of that, I would say that you would probably make, you'd need to make use of apps like Later, later.com. And that allows you to, um, to schedule your posts on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. So you don't have internet from Monday to Friday. You don't have internet for the next two weeks. Okay, you might have internet that one day that you go and you sit at a Java and you order a 220 shilling dawa. Sit there, schedule, work, work. Don't feel any shame if they're like, are you sure you don't want anything else, sir, madam? Nope, I'm good, thank you. Schedule, plan, give yourself time. Okay, all right, thanks for that. Now, um, Sharon, there's a question from Linda, and Linda is asking, what are some of the platforms and skills that are important when it comes to managing your content and your pages? So is that so she'd like this? Because uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think ultimately so, it's yeah. Because I you know I can't tell if you were selling uh, insurance, it would be different to you know the advice that I'd give you if you were selling lingerie, for instance. But for me, the two platforms that are like my king and my queen, it is Instagram and YouTube. That wasn't always the case. There has been a lot of evolution over the years. I think I started off with. What was the first one? Facebook, and then blog, and then Instagram, and then YouTube. I mean, it's, it's, it's evolved. But for me, it's definitely Facebook and, and, 
no, not Facebook, not Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. And what was the second yeah. part of that question? How, the advice or? I think that's, no, you know, so, that's so, yeah, I think you've answered it well, because I think she was just asking, what are some of the platforms and the skills that are important when it comes to managing the content and the pages? You've captured that very well, in fact, in your response, and also when you're going through your presentation, you did yeah. that as well. Now, you mentioned on blogs, so we have a question from Namuli, and uh, mm -hmm. she's asking, what is your opinion on blogs in 2020? Do people still read blogs? I mean, do you read my blog? I see you, girl. Who, is, who asked that girl guy? I don't know. But listen, do, do, do people still read blogs? Do, you know, people are not bombarded by choice. There are a million things trying to get their attention. If it's not a YouTube video, it's a Netflix show. If it's not a Netflix show, it's a tweet that came in. If it's not a tweet, it's an email. There's, whereas before, it was like, you've got KTN, KBC, NTV, you know, like it, it was, this is all you've got. Now people are, they, there's so many things. So do they read blogs as much as they used to? No, but I, do I think it's important? Absolutely. I think if you're starting any brand, you should have a website, it, maybe not so much a blog, but I think you ought to have a website somewhere where people can touch base. It, it doesn't matter if you're selling, what could you be selling? Batteries, cushions, Just have a website, yeah. have something that people can learn. This is who you, this is what you're about. Yeah, yep, Sharon. Um, Sharon, there's a question from Joki, and Joki Kibathi asks, how can you tell who is a good social media manager and a brand builder? Ooh, are we talking about social media management? Ooh, that's interesting. I wonder if the person who's <laughs> asked that is, uh, is trying to build their own brand. Oh, you see, I, in the past, I've, had, I've gone through how many? Two or three social media brand Wait, when, now you see I'm not sure if you're talking about managing my, a personal brand or your platform, but I think it would be the same thing. Uh, look, it's like any relationship. How do you know that this is the right person for you? You don't know, you've got to get in, you've got to kiss the frog. <laughs> There's so many analogies you can use, most of which are not appropriate for this, but you've just got to try and see, do they understand you? Do they speak your language? Are they consistent? Are they able to push your brand in the tone that represents you? Or are they saying, Hi, 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 guys, and it's H-A-E, you know? And, and, you know, maybe that's your brand too. Maybe, I don't know. But do they, are they able to, would you comfortably let them represent you in a meeting with, I don't know, Apple, uh, you know? So w would you be able to sit back and be like, this person understands me in and out? But I think it's also important to have structures. Nancy talked about that as well. Just make sure it's clear what the expectations are. Make sure that you have monthly reports where you can check and see, is this actually what I had um, expected of you or we'd sat down and talked about? There's so, so many variables here, I think. Um, Sharon, mm -hmm. well, another question, mm -hmm. which is, I, I think I have two more questions for you. Great. Now, yeah. um, and I think it's, it's, it's a lot more on what you've touched on the concept, but I think the questions are a bit digging into deeper into getting a more, a better understanding. Mm -hmm. So I have a question from Kaleche and uh, the question is, what can I give without giving too much in adding value through explainer mm -hmm. or educative or um, informative content? Like without giving too much information, what else, what would be the ideal way to communicate through the social media platforms that, um, for the business rather? I wish I had a concrete example of what business she's doing, but I think there's different things that you can offer your audience. You can offer inspiration. You can, you can offer behind the scenes, right? Because you want people to be able to see what's going into making your product or creating your service. Um, Shilandinda will often do, give snippets of behind the scenes of putting together her new salon and that creates anticipation. So take us behind the scenes um, you could offer humor, you know, make it a place where you don't just come and you're selling something to me all the time, but you're like, oh my God, that was so funny. Yeah, I'm going to keep scrolling. And then eventually I might just have a, a connection. It could be in the form of a meme. Um, it, it doesn't always have to be that you're offering up your, you know, your trade secrets. And because you've shared it, no one else will have it. 
it doesn't have, if you feel very sensitive about that, you don't have to offer that up. But I think there are different things that you can offer. Just think of a relationship. If you were with your partner and they were all the time just asking, 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 ask, just take a second, offer, give a giveaway, do a giveaway, offer them the product so that they can get a chance to try it. Um, what can I give? You know, it's, it's just like any relationship that you would have. And I think that ultimately is what creates a successful um, online presence for businesses. If there is, I want to give you something, I want to offer you value. Um, and it doesn't have to be in the form of my trade secrets. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 that is actually very, very well answered. Now on that, um, Sharon, my last question to you would be, um, how much does YouTube pay? This has just come Ooh, in right now. <laughs> this is a good one. We're getting into the juicy bits. Okay. Let me tell you something. Actually, I have a bone to pick with YouTube. Okay. And Dorothy is definitely not on this, but I have so many questions to ask Dorothy off of, of YouTube. But so you get paid the CPM. YouTube pays you, and especially depending on where you are, um, if, and we're, if we're talking about AdSense, because there's many ways to go about this. So if you're talking about AdSense, um, which is, you know, when an advert comes before a show and then you're like, skip ad, skip ad, please don't skip ad, especially if you like the content creator, because that's part of what a lot, you know, pays them. It's part of how they earn. Um, so they will pay you for a thousand views. If you are on this side of the world, that could be anywhere between one and two dollars for a thousand views. If you are in America or the UK, that would be seven dollars. So that's you know three times, four times. You know, if it's one dollar and seven dollars, that could even be seven times the amount. Um, what is the most that I have made on YouTube personally through the AdSense? It would it's it's been around five hundred dollars in one month, which isn't a lot of money. Um, but I also have to say I've not been that consistent with YouTube. So even that five hundred dollars, I only earned it this year in that month. Um, and it's because I've, try, I've tried to be a lot more consistent in the last few months than I've ever been with my YouTube. Uh, but do I think that there is room for growth? Yes, I have, I, I have goals and I can see that there is a, it's, it's, it's going up this way. Um, but I think that, yeah, that varies. There are other ways to make money off of YouTube, which is more than $500. And that is with having um, partnerships and collaborations with brands. That definitely pays more, at least for now and at least in the side of the world. All right, Sharon, um, I have one final question. I mean, apologies, because there are so many last, questions that come in, and I'm trying. This is the very <laughs> last one, because I, I really can't ignore this one, at least. Um, it's, um, so this is a question from Jasina. So Jasina asks, how do you maintain a balance between authenticity and originality in content creation? I mean, is there anything original? I think we've already established there's no such thing as original in 2020. There's always going to be something that you borrow from, I don't know, some, some other thing, something that inspired you. But I don't think that there's anything that's absolutely 100% original. And you've seen it. Have you ever had an idea and thought, oh, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that. You wait three months, six months, maybe even three weeks, and suddenly you see someone else have it and, or go forth with it. So... I mean, do I think that there could be anything that you've done that's never been done before? I'm not sure. But I do think ultimately what you need to do is find your voice and be able to make sure that that's seen. That takes a while, though, I think. Um, you know, I, I was actually even asking my friend Patricia uh, a week ago, I think. I was asking, babe, do I ask? Patricia is a good friend of mine, Patricia Kaharo. She's a content creator. You should follow her. But I was asking her, am I the same on YouTube? as I am in person, like if you saw, if, you know, as you watch my videos, are you just like, why is she doing that? That's not what she does in real life. And it, now she said, yes, she said, I'm, I'm same, same was up. Okay. Which is great. But I don't think it was always like that. And I think it takes time for you to get comfortable and let yourself be seen because the internet can also be a really dicey place. You never know what, how people might receive that. Um, yeah, but I don't feel pressure of it has to be 100% original, but also don't steal other people's creative work. Um, and especially when you're not even giving credit. But just focus more on just being yourself. Yeah, I think that should work. 
Thank you, thank you, Sharon. I and that 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 was my last question uh, for real. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much. You have really done well, and your presentation was good, and also answering the question and answers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the interactions. Thank you for the comments that you've shared. Thank you for the feedback. I mean, this is this was a powerful panelist. Like, I am extremely overwhelmed and with the knowledge and also the insight and also the comments that you've been sharing on the chat box and also your question and answers. I'm sorry, we could not take all the questions, but we invite you to connect with us um, after the webinar on our social media handle, um, Twitter. So Twitter, our handle is at MasterCard, M-E-A. <clears throat> at this point, before we wrap up, I would like to give an opportunity for our panelists to give their closing remarks. And I would like to start with, um, I'd like to start with, uh, with Mandy. Mandy, um, you're aware, I mean, there are a few questions that were sent through. Um, many of them touched on influencer marketing. A lot of them touched on content and just social media marketing, being authentic, being consistent and all of that. So I just welcome you to just give me your closing remarks for this uh, webinar. So first things first, um, there's a ton of people who have gone ahead to ask if this recording will be available. I'm pretty sure Teresa will um, let a, a lot of people know about that. But let me go ahead and um, wrap up by sharing. A lot of people have asked questions, especially around rate cards, right? So when you're building your rate card, build it according to uh, based on all of the things that you need to do to make the magic happen. For example, if you were taking an image of a meal, right, or an image of a dress, you need to factor in the cost of the photographer, you need to factor in the cost of doing a recce, if you need to go to that place, check the place, you need to factor the cost of buying ingredients for the recipe, or you need to also just factor in the fact that you have to pay yourself, right? So those are the things that you would need to now work on in terms of coming up with that rate fee. Um, because, for example, if you say um, you charge 10,000 Kenya shillings per post, that's based on what? How did you arrive at that number? So think about those things when you're thinking about a rate card. Another thing is um, I've noticed a couple of SMEs asked in here, what is the threshold of how many um, followers and influencers should have if you were to work with them? Anything from 2,000 plus. As long as they're consistent, as long as you see they have an engaging audience, I would say reach out to them. But all in all, I say you're going to need to realize that the landscape that we're in is very, very dynamic. You as a small business cannot choose to be static and expect to see growth you're going to need to adapt to what's happening in the landscape in order to increase revenue, to gain new audience, and to keep satisfying the current customers. Good, good. good. Thank you very much, Mandy. Um, I'd like to give an opportunity for Nancy to give us her closing remarks. I don't know if there's a question here. <laughs> So Nancy, it's, um, I think you've really captured a lot on business, mission, vision, and uh, of course, structure. A couple of questions that come, came through, uh, especially on structure, um, um, more so on SOPs, um, technology, what kind of technology do you have for your business and how you started from the bottom all the way up, up. Especially there was a question also that came through around inventory management and how you go about this for your business. So maybe in your closing remarks, you can touch on that. Okay, so thank you guys for having me. I have really had a good time. Um, and your questions, I've been answering questions, you know, just typing away. And you guys have amazing questions. You're really ready to learn. And um, let me talk about inventory management because that is a problem I solved this year, even after being in business for all this long. Like I said, I used to use Excel where you have all your inventory per the date. So what you could do is every day or every two days, you go... Um, uh, fixing your inventory. So you know you sold uh, a red dress in size medium. So you now have maybe 10 mediums in stock before you had 12, something like that. However, I mentioned currently I'm using WooCommerce. WooCommerce is uh, this, uh, the e-commerce platform for WordPress. And yes, it's paid, but guys, it's not expensive. Guys, you can go check my website, shopnewlevel.com. I did it myself because my 10 years of being a fashion blogger and
learning, you know, things. I've learned how to code things here and there and to kind of, you know, place things where they need to be. I know the vibe I want. So that's, I, I spent my quarantine time creating that website. And I believe you guys can do it as well. It's something you can easily learn and where you can't ask, ask the people around you, ask our developer, you know, if you're a student, you know, ask your IT, you know, maybe the IT department, you know, someone. I think it's something that you can manage to do. If I can do it, I believe that you can do it. So with inventory management, WooCommerce, I'm able to have inventory. So if I have 10 types of necklaces that I'm selling, 10 types of blouses that I'm selling, I'm able to have them. I always, I always, um, you know, name my items, like uh, maybe you can find a kimono called Book of Light kimono, then I'll write how many pieces I have. And for everyone that buys, it goes decreasing in inventory. And at the end of the month, I can be able to tell I sold 50 of those kimonos, which actually really helps because in the long run, what you want is you want to be able to look back at your data. And I know in the next three years by using this platform, I'll be able to see that maybe last year, July, we sold black pants. They were very popular. So why are people buying black pants in July? Is it cold? What is it? Is it a trend? I'll be able to tell such things. Um, so yeah, so that's it. And continue asking questions. I'll continue you know, answering. And guys, I had such a good time. I hope we can do this again. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Nancy. We, we hope we will be able to do this a second series once again. Thank you very much for your insight and also your contribution to that end. Now, um, Sharon, I would like to invite you to just give us your closing remarks on, on what you've covered on social media marketing for small businesses, the tips and, and everything. So, um, and even as you, as you, as you close off, um, Sharon, we also had um, a question, of course, that touched on how does one translate social media interaction to actual sales so maybe you could um, if you could actually um, respond to that as you as you as you close off yeah um, well I think I think I think the first thing to note is that it doesn't happen overnight you've got to take time I think building on audience takes time it's, especially if you're going the organic route um, you could also promote your content and that would help reach a larger audience but I think Ultimately, what you want to do is it, it goes back to building a, a community and it doesn't matter if what you're selling is insurance or hot dogs or, you know, jewelry. I think you need to try and make sure that people understand your story, that they understand you if you can and if you feel confident enough, tell your story, the person behind all of that, How, allow people to kind of get a feel of what it took to create this. Why is it special? What kind of value are you adding to your audience? Um, and I think, uh, all, I mean, ultimately, I wonder, like if you were to keep, if you were to keep sharing, if you were to keep giving, 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 then I think that should lead to some kind of sales. Um, because ultimately, I think if you're here, and especially for this, for this uh, masterclass, you're here because you're running a business or trying to build a brand, and you want to con some conversion and it you know, ought to lead to sales. But I think be consistent, give, you know, come ready to serve and with, with that being the first thing and that will ultimately translate into community and then sales. Good. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you so much everyone for your interaction, your comments Thank and your you. feedback. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, those powerful panelists for everything that you shared was quite valuable. Um, again, we couldn't take all the questions, but I think we've been able to um, answer as many as we could the, during the time that we had. And we invite you to connect with us after the webinar on our social media pages. On social media, we're at MasterCard ME. On Twitter, we're at MasterCard, um, at MasterCard MEA. And the hashtag, of course, hashtag MasterCard SME Masterclass. So thank you very much once again for joining our MasterCard SME Masterclass series webinar. We hope that you gained some valuable insights that will be beneficial in taking your business to the next level. In closing, I'd like to give a big thank you on behalf of MasterCard to all our experts and to everyone who was on the webinar today and for the great presentation, the insight and the valuable participation in this session. Um, the session will be recorded and it will be communicated on which platforms you will be able to share this, um, this recording. Thank you very much and have a lovely evening. Goodbye.